I'm Dwayne. I'm one of the pastors here at Cornerstone. It's my joy and honor to speak for you on the uh, second week of digging into Colossians. And Colossians is a great book. It's a great letter. Uh, as Pastor Joe talked about last week, Paul was writing to the Colossians. He hadn't been there himself. And so it, it was a cool place. There was a lot of things going on. And they were confronting some heresies and they were doing some things that were, were great. But he was also preparing them to be strong against what was not great. Um, and there were some things that he wanted to remind them of and also to instruct them in to make sure that since they were new believers, that they needed to have certain things in their life. That if they were truly going to live as a disciple of Christ, that these key elements had to be a part of who they were. The, the profile of a disciple really is what it looks like. Make sense? Everybody with me? We good? All right. Everybody got coffee? All right. If you're awake, say Amen. All right, so we're going to dig into that. So let's go ahead and stand and read some word. Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 through 14. And so, from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Father God, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for your Son, in whom we have forgiveness. We have redemption from sins. Lord, you have purchased us back, and Lord, we thank you and we praise you for that. So Lord, as we read your word, as we study your word, as we learn the profile of a disciple, Lord, open our hearts, give us an awareness of what needs to take place in our life, and Lord, give us that joy in knowing that you have made it possible. We thank you in your name. Amen. Please be seated. So everyone enjoy the Super Bowl last week? I was wishing the Seahawks were in it, but I was so glad the 49ers lost. <laughs> My sister lives in Kansas, and she's become a Chiefs fan. So she flew. She's been staying with us. She's a nurse and a traveling nurse. And so she's been with us for like the last couple months. But she actually flew home to be in Kansas for the Super Bowl, and she was at the parade, and they were going crazy. And so she took videos and was showing me and stuff. And the deepest thought I had when I'm seeing all these chief fans and, you know, they're shouting their things is, we're better. <laughs> Our fans are better. We're more hometown proud. And that should have been us. This has nothing to do with discipleship. <laughs> this is me just being honest with you about an area I need to work in. Because I was not only judgmental, I was prideful, I was arrogant. But if God forgives that, I think he forgives our hearts and how much we love the Seahawks. Amen? <laughs> now, if we all start, you know, skipping church to go to games, that might be a problem. <laughs> so we'll watch that. But I, I just watched all those people and just how excited the Chiefs fans were. And I remember that when we won the Super Bowl and how excited we were. And I just remember that feeling of joy, right? That struggle, that long, long struggle, right? Way back when, um, I had the misfortune of dating a Steelers fan. And this was way back when I was in college. And so I went during break, and I went to, to visit her family. And I didn't know she was a Steelers fan because I went to visit her in Arizona. So Cardinals, right? But it was during the Super Bowl when we played the Steelers. And they didn't know I was a Seahawks fan. And she said, hey, we're going to go to my grandparents' house. They're from Pittsburgh. <laughs> what? Yeah, our whole family is Steelers fans. So I told them you're coming. The only deal is you can't say a word. <laughs> and as we watched the replay of Roethlisberger sneaking that touchdown in, do you remember that one? I lost it. <laughs> Relationship ended. I'm glad for that. <laughs> I am married to a very proud, strong Seahawks fan. 
she's a stronger fan than I am. Like, she is hardcore. I mean, she's up on, on her legs, and she's screaming at the screen the whole time. And I'm just holding the kids. It's like, don't worry, Mommy still loves you. So if you can picture my very sweet wife screaming at the screen, that's what happens. But this joy that overcomes us when we get excited about our sports teams or when we get excited about, you know, the fruition of a long period of struggle, right? It's, it's overwhelming. And that's the joy that we should have when it comes to our relationship with God. Because that's the joy he has even more so now that we live in Christ. You see, that is the fruition of all of that struggle of existence before Christ came. When he came and conquered death and purchased us back and provided redemption and forgiveness of sins, heaven rejoices. And we're called to have that same joy every moment of our life because no matter what happens in this world, no matter what life throws at us, at the end of the day, we're still saved, we're still loved. God deeply loves and cares for us. Amen? And you are a saint. You are one who shares in the inheritance of heaven. You are co-heirs with Christ. And so that joy should be permeating everything we do. And no matter what we do, no matter what we go through, that should always be our fallback. No matter what happens. I've got God. God loves me. I've got an inheritance in heaven. I am a co-heir with Christ. I have been adopted into the family of God. Amen? What happened? Did you go to sleep? Amen? Amen. There we go. And that's a wonderful thing. Now, as we go through this profile of the disciple, I don't want you to feel like I'm saying, these are all the things you need to have, and if you don't have them, you're failing. I'm telling you all these things that should be a part of your life, and here's the good news, you can have them as a part of your life. Even if you don't have them in ever-increasing measure, you can have more of it, okay? This isn't about what you're failing to do. This is about the possibility and the joy you should have in that God has given you everything you need in order to have these things in your life in ever-increasing measure, amen? All right, so today is a joyous day. Are we in agreement? All right, this is a sermon of joy, not a sermon of condemnation. Unless the Spirit moves and... He decides to judge you. I don't know. That could happen. All right. So the first thing that we see here in the profile of a disciple in Colossians 1.9 is we see, and so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you. Okay. So Paul, who loves this, this new church that has started up, it says that once they heard about it, they did not cease to pray for them. Right? We've seen in other places in Scripture that we're supposed to pray constantly. Pray without ceasing. And so Paul modeled this, and he calls us to do the same. We have a focus in this church on discipleship, that not just for ourselves as being disciples of Christ, but that we're actually called to be out in the world discipling others, leading them into the ways of Jesus. That we're supposed to be showing them how to follow Jesus' truths and ways, and then through that process, they fall in love with Jesus and they become a true believer. But do we pray? Do we pray without ceasing for the people that we're discipling? And so it all starts with prayer. And Paul knows this. And so he's praying earnestly without ceasing. We are praying constantly for you, asking that you may be filled. Guys, anything worth doing for the Lord has to be covered in prayer. And some of you have told me, you know, I'm struggling, I'm trying. It's really hard reaching out to members of my community. It's really hard meet, reaching out to members of my, my family. It's really hard discipling others that I'm, I'm connecting with. There's, it's just such a struggle. And others have said, you know, it's just really such a struggle for me to live this out in my life, for me to really grasp who God is, for me to really feel alive when I show up on Sunday, to really be excited to sing worship to him. It's really hard for me to wake up and be ready to read the word and, and dig in and find God. So here's my question. Are we praying without ceasing? Are we praying for ourselves and are we praying for the people that we're reaching out to? 
Because if we're not doing that, we have no expectation of anything to happen. It needs to start with prayer. So if you're hungry to see a difference made in your life, and you're hungry to see a difference made in others' lives, you need to start with prayer, and you need to keep praying. It says pray without ceasing. It means don't stop. Don't pray once. We are such... um, ritual kind of Christians sometimes where we get into this mode of just praying once for thing and then checking it off a list. I prayed. Like Oaxaca, we just prayed. I really, really hope that that's not the only time we pray for this team. And yet, I can't tell you personally how many times I have prayed for a team and then forgotten to pray about them until they show back up, right? Anybody ever done that? And again, I'm I'm judging myself. I'm talking to myself. I'm preaching myself. I'm not telling you this to to condemn anyone here. I'm saying, look, this is something we have the opportunity and we have the ability to become better at. It's not in us naturally, but it is in God and he will give it to us if we pray for it. Do you ceaselessly pray for yourself, for the good things of God to be real in your life and do you ceaselessly pray for those you're reaching out to? And now, what this is, is this is an, uh, it's an acknowledgement that we are dependent on his activity. That we can't do this by ourselves. That we can't become a better disciple by ourselves. And we can't lead others into discipleship by ourselves. There is a deep dependence on God's activity. And so we invite him through prayer, and then we wait and we follow him. We do what he says. We know, I don't have it in me. I need it, God. I need it from you. This is your work. I am just your humble vessel waiting to be used. He says, and so from the day we heard, we did not cease to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will, that you may be filled. So we're praying to God that you will be filled from God. Does that make sense? And that's what that looks like. That's that, that act of us depending on God's activity to be real in our lives and real in the lives of the people that we're reaching out to, saying, God, I can't do this on my own. You're going to have to do something. So I am interceding on their behalf. I'm praying that you would fill them with the knowledge of their will. And see, sometimes we get that wrong. Sometimes we think, all right, as a Christian, I need to know every answer to every question. And I need to have such a deep understanding of Scripture that I can help them and answer all of the questions that they might throw at me. That I can guide them and direct them in their daily lives. That whenever they have a struggle, I'll know exactly what to say. The problem is, you're you. And that's not an acknowledgement of God's power, and that's not a dependence on his activity. We are called to be dependent on his activity for this to take place. And so a disciple is someone that is constantly aware of not only their need for God, but is praying for his holy filling in them. Thirdly, it's an awareness of his will. Are you aware of God's will? Now, some of you say, I don't know God's will for my life. Who isn't sure about God's will for their life on a day-to-day basis, right? It's a struggle. It's a struggle to know God's will. It's a struggle to, to discern God's will. But you will be given it, and here's the thing. You just need to be aware of his will. And what this means is you need to be aware of your need to have his will realized in your life. You need to be seeking it out and hungry after it, after it, sorry, hungry after it. I haven't eaten yet. I said hungry and I lost all train of thought for a second. (laughs) I think my first sermon ever at Cornerstone, I was supposed to have a meeting. This was like seven years ago and uh, it was a youth meeting. And so I had gotten everybody together and said, we're going to have a meeting in this room Right after service, we're going to go do that. I preached my sermon, and as I was preaching, I started thinking about chicken nuggets and how at McDonald's there was a 5 for 20 special. And that just became an all-encompassing, powerful thought in my head. And so as soon as I was done with my sermon, I peaced out. I drove all the way back to Sammamish and got my nuggets. And Terry Yoshimura was like, hey, where are you? We're all meeting. It's like, sorry. (laughs) The nuggets called to me. Uh, 
But you know, I got, I got something else I really want to focus on, and that's the food that comes from the Lord. No, I'm not, I'm not trying to make a joke. I'm serious. I need to focus on the fruit and the food that comes from God by depending on his activity and being aware of his will in my life. Amen? And I think we all want that. We all crave that. So if you crave it and if you're aware of it, he will give it to you. But it starts with prayer. Don't ask for God's will in your life if you're not willing to pray for it and seek him out. Don't ask for God's will in your life if you are not dependent on his activity. If you're just trying to get a blessing for whatever it is you want to do and keep doing, that's not how it works. So as we are aware of his will, it says we will gain knowledge of his will. And you can define knowledge of his will like this, an intelligent grasp of God's wishes and the conviction to do it. Right? And he'll give those in equal measure. So he's going to show you what to do, what he wants from you, his wishes for your life. And then he's going to give you the conviction to do it. And maybe that's where you back up and you say, whoa, 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 God, I heard you say this. I'm not sure I'm ready for that yet. I'm not sure you're really hearing from God because if you're really praying and hungry for God's will, not only will he show you what he wants from you, he will give you an overwhelming passion to follow it, to make it become a reality of obedience in your life. Asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding which means that from the Spirit, you are going to gain not only the knowledge of his will, but the wisdom of his will, which means the way to understand his will and apply it to life. That is wisdom. Wisdom is the knowledge of truth and the knowledge of how to apply it to everyday life. That is wisdom. A lot of people know facts, but they don't actually know how to live life. How many of you ever met a know-it-all that is really smart, knows everything, but they have no wisdom whatsoever? Amen? This happens all the time. My, uh, in, <laughs> in high school. So I, I went to a Christ, Christian camp, and uh, I, was, I was in a cabin with my friend Josiah. My friend Josiah had a, he was a smart guy, he was a bright guy, he knew what to say, he always would, you know, have answers for everything, but he was a horrible smart aleck. And um, one time, he started flirting with this girl, and this girl's brother was Vince. And Vince had just recently been released from juvie. Just a bad decision all the way around, right? He was also, you know, he was a football player, linebacker, huge guy. Not a nice dude. And so we were about 14 at the time. And uh, Josiah keeps, you know, uh, flirting with this girl and this, this Vince's sister. And Vince comes over to him and says, hey, it's my sister. Leave her alone. He says, Okay. He doesn't. Does he listen? No, he doesn't listen. He keeps flirting with her. And so he, things keep escalating. Uh, during a, a game at camp, Vince tackles him uh, so hard during the night game, cracks three of his ribs. That's fine. He's, he's alive. And so he deserved it too, let's be honest. And so he, you'd think he'd gotten the message, but no, he's still flirting with the girl. And so later that, uh, that week, there was a point where we were supposed to go to chapel, and on our way to chapel, we all of a sudden got locked in our cabin, and it was just me and Josiah. And in walks Vince, and he's got his buddies circling the cabin, and so it's just me, unfortunately, and I have no idea why I'm there. <laughs> My buddy Josiah and Vince, the human meat grinder. And he walks up to Josiah and says, I've warned you, I've told you, you need to leave my sister alone. And he pulls out a knife. Fun days, you know, Christian camp, right? <laughs> I'm so glad I was saved at that point. I was like, if I'm going to heaven, at least I'm ready. Oh. Actually, that's probably not what I was thinking. I was 14, let's be honest. <laughs> but he pulls out a knife. And my friend, who knows a lot of stuff, really smart guy, he says just the least wise thing you could have said in that moment. He doesn't say, I'm sorry, please don't stab me. He doesn't say, I'll never see your sister again, please don't fillet me. He doesn't say any of that. He says, I got a bigger knife than that. 
Vince throws it down, pulls out a bigger knife. <laughs> Finally, my friend shuts up. I won't tell you what happened next, but uh, we lived. Let's just say that. I'm pretty sure Vince went back to juvie after that, not long after. My friend had no wisdom. He knew lots of stuff. But it, when life actually <laughs> presented itself, life and death, real world application, he didn't know how to de-escalate. He didn't know how to, how to have I don't, uh, uh, common sense. But also he didn't know how to have humility in that moment and just go, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. See, when God gives us his will, it says he gives us all spiritual wisdom and understanding. So not only is he going to make you aware of his will, not only is he going to give you the conviction to follow it through, he's going to give you the ability and the knowledge of how to apply it and how to actually go about it, how to make it a reality in your life. And this is good news because so many of us get trapped up in what does God actually want from me? How am I supposed to go about it? And sometimes we say, well, just keep praying. God will show you. And that's true. You don't need to fear God's will. If fearing God's will is keeping you from praying his will in your life, you're missing out on so much. God is going to show you his will. He's going to give you the ability to follow through, and he's going to show you how to actually live it out in your daily life. As we do this, becomes easier and easier. And the reason is, just like anything, repetition brings understanding, doesn't it? The more and more you do something, the better you get at it. The more and more you seek out God's will, the more and more you're going to understand his will. The more and more you step out in faith and follow God's leading, the easier it's going to become to trust in God. It doesn't mean it's going to be easy to do what he's asking you to do. I think God tends to raise the bar on us each time, don't you? I think we follow God and God just keeps raising the bar and saying, yep, and now another, and now another, because he wants us to be strengthened. He wants us to be strong disciples. He wants us to grow in our knowledge of him. But having that, that repetition and that history of following through, we are going to begin to become more trustful and more faithful in pursuing his will. To be a disciple is someone that's always constantly following after the one that is discipling you. And we're supposed to be disciples of Christ. And so we're always supposed to be continuously following the ways of Christ and the teachings of Christ. And we can read a lot about Christ. But if you don't ever actually put the things that he said to do into practice, you'll never gain the wisdom that comes from not only knowing God's truth, but also applying it to life. So you need to keep putting it into practice, keep putting it into practice, and you will have an increasing measure of understanding from him. And what this will lead to, it says this, may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as, that's the connecting phrase, right? So you're going to get all this, and then this is what will come of it. So pay attention to this. So as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. Again, we just talked about discipleship. It is following after him, doing the things he did. Learning to apply the things he said to do. You won't know it unless you try it. And again, the good news is you've been given everything you could possibly need. Remember, Paul is talking to a church who just became Christians out of a crazy world. They didn't have the luxury of, you know years of training in the, the Sanhedrin, in the synagogue, in the temple. They didn't have years of training by Christian parents who understood things. They were brand new believers, and yet he's talking to them like they're ready to accomplish all this. Why? Because it's not dependent on them. It's dependent on God. And all you need to do is seek his will, and this will become a reality in your life. You will have more spiritual understanding. You will have more spiritual wisdom. You will begin to walk more in a manner that pleases the Lord. And we all want to walk in a manner that pleases the Lord, don't we? Amen? But we have to be praying constantly, and we have to have an awareness of his will in our lives, always asking every moment of every day, God, what do you want me to do today? God, where do you want me to lead, or where do you want to lead me today? It could be as simple, and I've seen things happen this way. 
I've been driving down the road, and I felt the Holy Spirit tell me to pull over and park at a certain Starbucks. And as I'm sitting there at the Starbucks, I have a conversation with somebody who then, because of that conversation, becomes a, f- a follower of the Lord and becomes a believer. And through that, they become not only a believer in the Lord, but they become a strong believer in the Lord who leads others to the Lord. And all it started with was I was aware of his will. I was aware of the Holy Spirit's tug. And when he said something, I listened. And the only reason I listened is because at that moment, at that time, I'd done it before. And I said, I know this. I don't know much. I always don't know what God says. But I know if I feel that tug, I should probably do it. God's got something amazing in store. I had no idea what was going to happen, but God did. And God wants those moments for every single one of you. God is tugging at each and every one of your hearts saying, I have something amazing in store for you today if you would just listen. We read that phrase, walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. It doesn't mean he wants us to be perfect in his ways. It doesn't mean we have to be perfect little Christians doing everything he told us to do as as commands and obedient. It means he loves us so much, he wants us to walk in his ways because that's a blessing, not a burden. He wants to give us more of himself in those moments, not more commands and and dictation and, and, you know, things to do that are just going to weigh us down. He wants to free us from the daily trap of our life and open us up to the heavenly and the spiritual and show us what's possible with our lives if we would just follow him. You, you, we all have pursuits. We all have desires. We all have hopes. We all have plans, you know? We all have retirement. We all have all these things that are... That are building up towards something. But my question is, are we really living our lives now? Maybe you have it in your head, one day when I'm retired and my kids are raised and everyone's out of the house, then I'm going to fully live for the Lord. Why would you want to waste that much time? Why would you want to miss out on those, all those amazing opportunities? And, you know, to put a little more personal spin on it, what about all those people that you could have encountered in that time? What about all those conversations with people who are hurting and lost and hopeless and stuck in despair or an addiction that you weren't able to reach because you were so busy planning your life for the next 20 years that you forgot to be present and aware of his will in every moment? You know, I just told you that story about um, a friend of mine who I was able to lead to the Lord because I just randomly showed up at a Starbucks. It didn't cost me anything. I was going to Starbucks anyway. I was just going to go to a different one. And yet God corrected me on my path and said, no, I want you to go here. And so I did. And if I'd gone to the other Starbucks, my life would have continued. I would never have known. I would have missed out without knowing all that I was missing out on. It's possible. It's possible that every day you wake up, God has something unbelievable in store for you that will not only change your life, it will change the life of someone you care about who you don't even maybe know you care about yet. Again, future spouse. You don't know. It's by living out his will in the simple things that we begin to understand more and more about the hard things. Faithful repetition leads to deeper growth and wisdom. It leads to an easier engagement with his will because we've learned through experience When God tugs, I go, because God's got something amazing in store, and I don't want to miss that. So as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him. And I just, I love that. I love that so much because we sometimes think that means, like, please God by making him happy by doing his commands. Like, he's a taskmaster, and if we check off all the lists, he'll be like, a happy boss because we got all our work done. That's not what he's saying there. He's saying by fully pleasing him, the, 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 the actual words used talk about like a son and a father or like a parent and a child where someone is really living up to their potential and becoming like them, like they're passing the baton, right? And so if we walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, God is actually looking down on us as his children saying, see, I told you. 
I am so proud of you. I'm so happy for you. I'm so excited for you because this is what I had for you today. And you did it. Isn't it wonderful? And if you walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, you begin to bear fruit in every good work. Well, we, we talk about this, this is, we're pursuing holiness in this moment, where we're really, truly being a son and a daughter of the Lord, and we're walking in a way that is pleasing to him. We're pursuing that holy relationship with God, where we're not only in his will, we're in every moment expecting something amazing from our Father, expecting a gift from our Father. My kids, they're not spoiled, but they're getting there. They're, um, you know, uh, they have two sets of grandparents, and they have two aunts, because I have two sisters, and we're the only ones with kids. So Christmas is just like a giant them fest, right? Like everybody wants to buy presents for them and gives them presents. They have, they have too much stuff. But um, it's interesting, if I go away for a while, one of the things that they know is that if, if daddy comes home, they're going to get something, right? Daddy's going to buy them something random. They know if their grandma, who's here tonight, whenever she comes home, she's going to bring them something. It's okay. You don't have to apologize. It's okay. <laughs> That's what grandmas are supposed to do, right? They're supposed to spoil their grandchildren. That's all right. And so when Oma, that's, that's Dutch for grandma, when Oma walks through the door, they go, Oma, what'd you bring? <laughs> And Declan runs up, candy? <laughs> you know, and Michaela's too little to have words, so she just, like, raises up her arms. And so I think about that, and I think that's, that is how we're supposed to look. We're supposed to look not just with our arms raised because God's going to pick us up, but we're supposed to raise up our arms and know, you have something for me, don't you? Every day, Lord, you want to give me something. You have a gift you want to bless me with. What is it? And that's okay. That doesn't make us spoiled Christians. That means we're actually Christians. We're living it out. We're full disciples. That every moment of every day, whenever we meet with God, God, you have something for me today. You want to give me something. I, I just, I crave it. I need it. I want it. But it's different because it's not just for us. Right? Human gifts, earthly gifts, they're, they're, they're for us. Godly gifts are meant to be used to bless others. And so we should be always looking up to God, saying, Lord, what do you have for me? Yes, awesome. Lord, how can I give this? And we give it. Lord, what else? Okay. And that's the posture we should have. We should have an expectation of blessing in our lives, that every day we chase after the Lord, he is going to give something to us, and he's going to bless us with something amazing. And you will bear fruit in every good work. You will bear fruit in every good work. Every good work doesn't mean you will bear fruit in Bible study. You will bear fruit in watching a Francis Chan podcast. You will bear fruit in highlighting certain words and passages in Scripture because you want to remember them. Those are all good things, don't get me wrong. But it says you will be given fruit in every good work. In other words, you will bear fruit and it will be taken from you in a good way. That you will be laboring to give your fruit. As the Lord blesses you with fruit, you're going to give it. And you're going to keep giving it. Bearing fruit in every good work. There's an expectation of blessing. But there's also that comes with that. If God gives you something, if God really blesses you with something, there's going to be a discontentment with it. Because if you hold on to it and you hoard it, what happens to fruit that you hold on to too long? It spoils. It goes rotten. It becomes useless. Fruit is meant to be eaten, right? It's meant to be used. But when you have too much fruit... <laughs> There's a book that my kids read. I think it's called Too Many Mangoes. Does anybody know this book? And so I think uh, one of my wife's aunties in Hawaii gave 
my kids this book, and they love this book, and it's the story of this tree that has too many mangoes. And so these two little kids have all these mangoes from their grandfather's tree, and they said, why don't you just go give them out to the neighborhood? And so they go to the neighborhood, and they, as they give blessing, they receive blessing, and then they have more than they ever thought they would have. And that's that picture of what God does with us. He's going to give us fruit, and he's going to give us so much fruit if we're in, you know, constantly praying and, and, and expecting him to bless us. He's going to give us so much fruit that if we don't use it, it's all going to go bad. And so we need to actually be out there spreading it and sharing it. Do you have an insatiable hunger to feed others because that's what God's going to give you when he gives you that fruit. It's that discontentment that this isn't just for me, this is for someone else too. Are you sharing your fruit? When God gives you good things, do you immediately run out and tell people and share it with those? You never know who's going to be encouraged by what God is doing in your life. Bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. And I love this because this is a, like a promise from God. Not only are you going to feed others with this fruit that you are expectantly waiting on, but as you give it, you're going to get more. You know, another agricultural kind of uh, principle is if you let a tree just grow fruit on its own, but you never harvest it, what becomes to the tree? It doesn't produce much fruit. It doesn't need to. But if you're continually harvesting the fruit, what happens to the tree? bears more fruit. It's trying to keep up. And God does that with us. You see, the more we give of our fruit, the more God is going to give. And we'll keep having that insatiable hunger to feed others, and our impact will grow. And the reality of our life as a disciple of Christ is going to grow. And you're going to have an increasing yield of love and righteousness in your life. bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God and being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy. I love that. Strengthened by his power and having that endurance with joy. You see, as we live this life of constant expectation of blessing and giving of blessing and receiving of blessing and letting that fruit of the Lord just be a part of our everyday life, there are going to be hard times. There's going to be struggles. There's going to be trials. There's going to be persecutions. And yet through all that, as you're walking more and more in the ways of Christ, doing the things he did in the way that pleases him, listening to his spirit and following him wherever he would lead, you are going to become stronger for it, more able to stand up to the storms of this life. The more you've trusted in his will, the easier it will be to sustain yourself and your faith and depend on him when everything else falls apart. And some of you have had everything else fall apart. And it's been hard. And it's been a struggle. But you remain faithful. And one of the beautiful blessings that that gives is it gives you that awareness of, I've been here before. I have been at the bottom of this well, and I know the one who holds me in his hands, and he will find me, and he will pick me up, and I will be set right again. I will be okay. And it's that faith that gets us through those hard times. He strengthens us with his power according to his glorious might. And don't forget that part. His glorious might. Whatever you're going through, God is bigger. Whatever comes at you, God is stronger. Whatever impending darkness flies at you, God is brighter and better and will pick you up out of the muck and mire and he will save you. And he will put you back on a path of receiving fruit and giving fruit and receiving more fruit and increasing your yield of love and righteousness in your life. We call that, we call that like a joyful struggle towards heaven. And that's really what our life is. It's the joyful struggle towards heaven. 
It's finding joy in the hard things that no matter what life brings, God is still good. God is still on his throne. He's going to get me through this. He's going to give me an opportunity today to bless someone. And it's going to be that much sweeter because it will have come through struggle. Really, really good fruit comes from struggle at times. Lastly, there's a humble gratitude in everything we do. Because where did we start in all of this? Praying without ceasing and a dependence on his activity. And so all of this that happens in our lives, all of this, this profile of, of our discipleship, we don't get to take credit for it. It all started with God. It was all about God. It was all through the power of God. And we were blessed to be used in that way. And so there's this, this humble gratitude of, Lord, thank you. Thank you for using me today. You didn't have to. And that's the thing. God doesn't need us. God doesn't have to use us. God doesn't have to bless us. He wants to because he loves us. He wants us to participate in his activity because he wants us to know him more. He wants us to love him more. And he wants us to love others because in loving others, we understand him more. We understand his heart. And we give thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has, now remember, in this whole thing, he's talking in, in future tense, but now he switches to past tense. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption and forgiveness of sins. That's set. We don't have to earn that. This, this stuff is not how we get this. It's because of what God has done. It's because of the sacrifice of his son that this, all this stuff we've really been talking about, that's all enabled because of what he's done. Our inheritance with the saints, our inheritance in his kingdom, that's set. You don't have to earn that. So if you say to yourself, well, I'm not sure I'm doing this, so am I, I mean, is my salvation in jeopardy? No. But you are missing out on the blessing of God every day. You are missing an opportunity to be used by him. You are missing out on the best life you could ever hope for. God still loves you. God still has an inheritance for you. God will still bless you. But we want and we crave more blessing in our lives. Not just so that we can be a blessing to others, but because we want to know and serve and love our God more. Because that humble gratitude also comes from just that awareness of, you didn't need to save me, Lord, and yet you did. You didn't have to love me, and yet you did. You didn't have to rescue me, and yet you sacrificed all so that I might live. So thank you, God. Thank you for giving me this ability to follow you. Thank you for allowing me to participate in joy and endurance. Thank you for allowing me to participate in this cycle of blessing that as you give to me, I can give to others and see the light of faith spread. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for all of this. And if you want all of this, everything we talked about, again, it starts with prayer. That's the first step. Start praying and don't stop. Seek him and don't quit. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. Right now, I just want us to focus on him. So right now, we're going to pray. So bow your heads and close your eyes. As you pray, ask him to give you that overwhelming desire to keep praying and to never stop, to pray for yourself, to pray for others, that you would really live in discipleship. 
that you would wait on blessing from the Lord and that you would give the blessings of the Lord. That you would find his best in every moment. So right now you pray. cry out to you. We want more of your blessing in our lives. Father, we crave the good fruit that you have to give. Lord, make us aware of your will, that we would never miss an opportunity to be blessed by you and to bless others and to see more knowledge, more understanding, more fruit, more depth come to us so that we can continue to bless others, so that we can make your kingdom known that everywhere we would go, we'd be a light in a dark place, that we would bring joy and hope. And Lord, thank you, Father, that you have made this possible. Lord, all you need from us is our hearts. So Lord, we give you our hearts. Lord, do your will in us. Do your work through us. Yield us to your spirit. Bow us before your presence. Thank you and we praise you for this.